existing shot, which so sightly that we ought to keep it fresh on our lips today, inshallah, throughout the Namaz, during and after, inshallah. <laughs> Apologize if you see me adjusting this mic a lot. It makes me feel like a Backstreet Boy. Like the PTA, so I have singers, so sometimes they'll get here, but shall um, Don't be distracted by it. I'm trying that. Bismillah. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. In Ahmadu, who and a Stain, a moon of stop, who when I hold the villa, he means Shuri and Pusina, or in Sayati, a Malina, Mayad Hilla, who fella, who did the law, Mayud, Fala Hadiella, but a Shadwella, Ila, Illa, the Ula, Sharika. وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وسلم. All praise and all praises to be to Allah alone, from whom we seek help and from whom we seek forgiveness. We seek refuge with Allah. Seek refuge with Allah from the evil of our own souls and from those who are bad deeds. Whomsoever Allah guides will never be led astray. Whomsoever, whomsoever Allah leads astray, no one can guide. I bear witness that there is none worthy of worship except Allah, that there's no God but Allah who is the one and has no partner. And I bear witness that the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, is indeed his true servant and messenger. Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu taqullah haqqa tuqatihi wa la tabutunna illa wa antum muslimoon. O ye who believe, be mindful of Allah. Be mindful of Allah in the way that Allah deserves and do not die except in a state of full submission to Allah. Ya ayyuhun nas utaku rubbakum ulladhi khalakakum min nafsin wahida wa khalaka minha zawjaha wa batha minhuma rijalan kathiran wa nisa'a wa attaku Allah alladhi tasa'aluna bihi wal arham inna Allah kana alaykum rakiba O humanity be mindful of your creator be mindful of your creator who created you from a single soul and from that single soul created its mate and through this mate created countless human beings that are spread across the earth and be mindful of your creator in whose name you appeal to one another and honor your ties of kinship and your ties of your families. Surely Allah is ever watchful over you. Ya be mindful of Allah. Be mindful of Allah in the way that Allah deserves and say what is right. Allah will bless your deeds for you and forgive all of your sins. And whoever obeys Allah and the messenger of Allah has truly achieved a great triumph. رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحل الوقت من لساني يفقهوا قولي سبحانك لا علم لنا الا ما علمتنا انك انت العليم الحكيم pray that Allah may open my chest and make this task easy and loosen the knots of my tongue that the speech may be understood and glory be to you Allah glory be to you alone we have no knowledge except that which you have taught us verily it is you who are the all knowing and the all wise Allahu akbar Allahu akbar la ilaha illallah Allahu akbar Allah Allah is the greatest. Allah is the greatest and there's no God, but Allah and Allah is the greatest. Allah is the greatest and to Allah belongs all of your praise. So again, to each and every one of you, to your families, to those who are attending online, uh, to those who are able to be here, to those who are here in spirit, Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuhu and Eid Mubarak to you. So many of us are probably familiar with the story of Eid al-Adha, our uh, story of the Eid of sacrifice. We may, to some degree, have heard of it, whether this is our first time being in uh, Eid Salah or Eid gathering, or maybe it just passing by. 
So thinking about what is Eid al-Adha mean, just literally, so just in case you show up and you know what you're here for, the Eid al-Adha just in its literal sense means the festival or the holiday of sacrifice. And what is the sacrifice that is being commemorated or recognized? Um, it's a familiar story that's found within the tradition of Islam, as well as in the tradition of uh, the Bible and Judaism and Christianity when it comes to the sacrifice of uh, Abraham or the, the sacrifice that Abraham was charged with making. And so not to give a historical uh, perspective or anything like that, but just so everyone has some familiar ground with which we'll be then going forth from. But in both the Quran and the Bible, we have this narr narrative of Ibrahim alayhi salam, the Prophet Abraham, have, being taken to trial with respect to having to sa uh, sacrifice a son. Um, and the, uh, the intervention, the divine intervention that came of this, uh, commemorating this read, commemorating this uh, day that we celebrate the sacrifice of this Prophet that uh, was willing and ready to sacrifice that which he loved most. But oftentimes, as we talk about this sacrifice, we sometimes lose uh, a little bit about what else kind of was happening in there. And so inshallah, just to give a little bit of a recap with respect to what this sacrifice was, what did it mean? So in the Bible, Abraham is commanded uh, in Genesis to take your son, take your only son, Isaac, and in the Bible, it's Isaac, uh, whom you love. So God acknowledges that take your son whom you love, this is someone that means a lot to you, go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering uh, on one of the mountains that I shall show you. And in this narrative, Isaac is unaware. He's not, you know, really sure of what is happening. So, you know, Abraham goes with a couple of his folks and Isaac, it's like a father and son hunting trip. They just go into the mountains and Abraham or his son Isaac just thinks it's going to be another father-son um, outing. But, uh, you know, not exactly what happens in that sense. Uh, he, he It shows the unawareness of uh, Isaac to the situation when he asks, the fire and the wood are here, Father, but where is the lamb of a burnt offering? And Abraham gives a response of, you know, God will provide, uh, knowing exactly what he what the offering is to be. And in this narrative as well, you have Isaac being bound. So you have that at the moment in which uh, the sacrifice is about to take place, um, Isaac is bound and... Uh, you have Abraham ready to take a knife to, to come to do the sacrifice at which the divine intervention comes in. And so it's a very kind of harrowing scene in a sense when you think about the narrative in that sense. Now thinking about what's in the Quran that Ibrahim salam is given the glad tidings of a son who was born just shortly before these verses in which we encounter that uh, this sacrifice is to take place. You have a son that you have uh, Ibrahim salam uh, praying for a son. You have him praying for a son, and we, we will talk a little bit about what, what, what's the significance of this. But he's given the glad tidings of a son that is halim, a son who is forbearing, a son who is patient. And his next uh, aspect of going into this, uh, this relationship with the son is that when his son is old enough to work with him, as the Quran says, that Ibrahim says, my dear son, I have seen a dream. I have seen a dream in which I am sacrificing you, that I have to sacrifice you. And Ibrahim says to him, tell me, what do you think? What's your opinion about this? What, is, uh, what, what do you think about this? And Ismail responds that my father, do as you are commanded. If Allah wills, you will find me amongst the calm and the steadfast. So that you do me, inshallah, in a sabiri, you'll find me amongst the nation, the steadfast. It's a very different narrative in a way, apart from uh, Islamic tradition generally identifying that Ismail or Ishmael was the son being sacrificed. But in the two narratives, you have quite a bit of a difference. In one, you have a very uh, one-sided kind of a narrative with respect to there's not necessarily a consent. There's a little bit of a misleading with respect to what's going on. And then all of a sudden you have, when you look up the artwork of the binding of Isaac or the sacrifice of Abraham, it's a pretty vivid scene. You know, Isaac is, you know, in, in a bit of a torment and Abraham's about to have a go at it. And the angels are restraining him back saying, no, 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 don't do that. Um, but you think about what is narrated in the Quranic sense. And we'll talk about when oftentimes in this narration, we sometimes struggle to find a connection. We sometimes struggle to think about when this narrative is preached to us on this day that, oh, you know, Abraham is about to sacrifice his son. Why don't you sacrifice more? Where's the, how can we relate to something? 
How can we find a connection to something that's so vivid and so difficult for us to imagine, especially in our day and age, to be able to sacrifice someone like a son or something so beloved or something so vivid with respect to a father taking a knife and about to um, put about or about to slaughter their son? It's, it's a hard image to grasp. And I think when we center just this image, center just this one part of the sacrifice of the story, we do a little bit of a disservice to the mountain of sacrifices that are happening by the people in the story, by the people outside on the sidelines of the story. And so oftentimes we all, we make it feel otherworldly. We make, we make it feel like a, a situation that just not reflective of our human experience. It's something that just happened back then. It's not something we do now. And so it becomes a very dislocated experience. And so, you know, when we connect to our specific time, it's it's not like you can just go tell your kid like Ibrahim did, like, yeah, but yeah, I saw a dream and I'm going to go sacrifice you. Most likely your kid's going to put you on TikTok and you're going to see CPS outside your house if something like that is to happen. And that's not the case in, in, in the sense when we don't water down the story, when we don't oversimplify the story, because we look at these characters and when it's just said that this is what the pinnacle of sacrifice is, this is what um, you should be shooting for, this is what um, the standard is, and only this, we sometimes make these characters, we make these prophetic figures, we make these uh, pious predecessors one-dimensional. We make them very flat in terms of their emotions and their depth that, oh, Ibrahim saw a dream. Look at his, uh, look at his uh, act of faith. He went to his son and then he said, let me go ahead and uh, son, I've seen, a, I've seen a dream. Let me go ahead and uh, tell me what you think about this. And his son says, I'm, I'm patient. I'm forbearing. Do what you want. Ibrahim was a parent. Ibrahim waited 80 years for a child. Ibrahim was someone who the Quran says he's an ummah on his own. He was an isolated person. He was alone. He didn't have a huge nation or community behind him. He likely just had a few people. And for him, 80 years to have a son that already we'll talk a little bit about, he's been through some trials with, up to this point says, sacrifice your son. Why would he ask the question, I've seen a dream, Tell me what you think. He could easily just go up and say, all right, do, do what kind of biblical Abraham did and said, all right, let's go hunting. Let's go do, let's go do this and just follow through with it. It shows you there's a little bit of tension. What could he have been thinking? You read into it, but you read into it in there. We, we still preserve the sanctity of Ibrahim. We still preserve the sanctity of the people and the message of the Quran. But what's on the in-between? When he says, what do you think about this son? Tell me, what do you think? He could have easily as a father gone in so many different directions. But that could tell you what, what's, what's kind of going on. And when, Ibra, when, when Ismail responds, tells him, Father, do what, you, do, do what you commanded. You'll find me as one of the patient. Thinking about that this is not his first rodeo with his father in terms of the experiences he's had. This is not the first um, time that his family has been tested by Allah. That he is someone who Allah from his birth has said, we give you glad tidings of a patience. Thinking about what all is missing in the narrative when we just hollow out these characters, inshallah. So this Eve, let us lean into a little bit of reflecting on this holistic nature of the sacrifice. Because I guarantee when we do so, you will find that you can connect to so much more of the story, so much more of what's going on than just Ibrahim being taken to the extreme task of sacrificing the thing that he loves the most or the person he loves the most for the sake of Allah. You'll find yourself being able to connect to those access points. Because when we see that in Ibrahim's story of sacrifice, that when we look at this story holistically, when we look at it in its context, we'll see that this was not the first sacrifice that Ibrahim or his family had to make, or that Ismail had to make, or that his family, uh, Hajar, his mother had to make. This was not the first and only sacrifice. And when we sometimes just say, this is the sacrifice, we do a disservice to the progress of faith. We do a disservice to what is the experience of faith like? So when we see the sacrifice of Ibrahim in just that moment, and the tribulation is in the space, and we only narrow it to this, we discount for fact with respect to how Ibrahim and in the space right before then, 80 years, we know a little bit about his youth and upbringing. He was having uh, issues with his father. He was having issues with his society there. He was coming up already. He had his son. The challenges didn't go away there. He, had to, he, he was told to take them to a barren valley. He, he was tasked time and time and time again that you have this, this life of sacrifice. 
And so when you have the pinnacle point of his sacrifice, you have this moment where he is now taken to the task of having to sacrifice the thing he loved the most. That's not what Allah started him off on. Allah started him off on a path that involved multiple other sacrifices to a point to where this was a model of Ibrahim. Of, is this, the, this is the final test with respect to how his devotion has crescentoed, how his devotion has hit a peak. He didn't just start at that. He built it up from there. And sometimes we just look at that and we say, that's the start. And so now I, I can disconnect with it. I can connect with it. But it sometimes becomes a little bit unhealthy if we think that this is the only thing. And we sometimes miss out on what all that there is there, inshallah. So, and to the, to the fact as well, that as our Prophet Sallallahu community, as the community here is not just of men and not just of boys, the community, the family of Ibrahim was also one that was diverse. At least in the specific setting, you have Ibrahim, you have his son Ismail, and you have Haji. Some uh, scholars will say that at this point she had passed away. Uh, others, others will say, no, she was still there. Just thinking about what did Ismail sacrifice in giving consent to his father? What did Hajar sacrifice? Knowing that this was a woman who uh, was already a stranger in her land and had so many other degrees um, that were weighing her down from other things and had to migrate for the sake of their cause, had to leave home, had to do all these different things. What did Ibrahim have to sacrifice? So where do you find points of connection when we think about this instance? When we think about this aspect of sacrifice that when we see just two verses, as we mentioned, for the story, the, the story of the sacrifice, Ibrahim supplicates. Rabbi habli minas sali. My Lord, bless me with a righteous offspring. Give me a righteous offspring. Now, the context is important because it's understood, as we mentioned, that Ibrahim is an elderly person. He's 80 years old or so. He's, he's being blessed now with a son. He's asking for a son. But imagine the societal pressure. We give couples and newly married people like two, three years before we start knocking at their door saying, hey, when are you going to have kids? When are you going to have kids? Now imagine a society, just like in our Prophet Sallallahu time, it's not too hard to think about the pressure of having children, that if you don't have children, your line's not going to continue. Just imagine what that might have meant in this context as well, with respect to what he's thinking about. So you have emotional weight, you have the pressure, and then when the time does come, you know, it's, it's, it's at a, a circumstance that feels unusual with respect to such an elderly person. But to this prayer that Ibrahim still supplicates, and who knows how long he'd been supplicating it for, Allah responds that we gave him that good news. We gave him the news of a Ghulam and Halim. We gave him the good news of a boy that would be a son that would be patient and forbearing. And imagine what this might have felt like. Imagine the 50, 40, 60, even like 10 years of prayer that the uh, Prophet Ibrahim had been making for this point. Imagine to hear something like this, to finally hear something like that, what, what, what that would have meant for him emotionally. Think about his emotions. Don't just think about him in the black and white sense. Think about his emotions, whether it's shock and awe, whether it's just relief, whatever it might be. It's peculiar as well as we mentioned because Ibrahim was that person whom the Quran says, Kana umma. he was in and of himself. But think about what does that statement make mean in the context of who he was and where he was at. He was alone, practically. He didn't have a nation behind him. He didn't have these communities behind him. You would imagine he's a pretty much a little bit isolated. He's a little bit alone. So given the fullness of this life, given the fullness of, of what's going on here, you have all of this built into the sacrifice, into this moment, into this leading up where he's then shown a dream. So inshallah, as we, as we wrap here, just thinking about that in the same tradition, just a little earlier, before he gets to this point where the Quran says he was able to work with Ibrahim, he was able to serve with him. Right before leading up to that point, we know that the famous story of Hajar and Ismail being left into the Valley of Mecca, or in the Valley of Bakka, that they're taken by Ibrahim, and God has them, uh, has cast Ibrahim to leave them in this valley, that he will provide for them, he'll take care of them. But just think about that journey. They didn't have GPS. They didn't have rest stops. They didn't have any of that stuff. These three individuals, one was an infant child and one a mother who's already disconnected from her own people are being taken further into the wilderness and are being left into that space. His firstborn son, the son who has spent who knows how long praying for, he has to now take him to what we would uh, determine to be a certain death out in the wilderness out in Makkah. If you've been to Makkah, if you've been for Umrah, when you go outside all the hotels and whatnot, you drive into the outside, there's not a lot of water there. It's a, it's a very inhabitable 
inhospitable area with respect to the environment. It's a very harsh environment when it comes to trying to cultivate something. And so he didn't just do this robotically. Imagine leaving your world, your family there in this space. He goes and turns around and he immediately supplicates. He prays to Allah to give of these people, for, uh, of, of, to make them uh, not just of their physical nature sustained, make their hearts sustained. Give their hearts that nourishment. Provide them with fruits as well. Give them some respite so that they might be people who express gratitude, so that they might be people who live and to continue to claim your name. So imagine what this was like, not just for him. Imagine what it was like for Haji, who practically became a single mother at that point. Imagine what it was like for her to have gotten to that moment. She was already a foreigner, as we mentioned, but when she has seen Ibrahim leaving, she calls out to Ibrahim, has Allah commanded you to do this? Think about the strength of this woman where she says, has Allah commanded you to do this? And he says, yes. And she says, then we will not be lost. This is that same woman that if she had that promise, she had that statement, she didn't just sit under a tree and say, all right, I'm, Allah's going to take care of us. We're just going to sit back and wait till Allah comes and takes care of us. She ran between two mountains. She put in the work. She still ran. She still felt that anxiety. She has a, a baby in the middle of the desert that doesn't have watch. Just imagine a, only a mother can maybe imagine this kind of a love for a child with respect to seeing what it what, what the child may be uh, experiencing to make you want to go run back and forth between mountains looking for water. Think about this stress, what, what that relationship means, what that experience means to that sacrifice. And now thinking about right after this prayer, right after this request, right after the grant, you have uh, Ibrahim now being taken another, again to the task to be able to say what uh, to my son, uh, I've seen this dream, I have, I've, I've seen myself sacrificing you. What is the cost of a son at that time? And so all of these sacrifices though, parts to a whole, it was that one sacrifice that is a hallmark, is the blockbuster one, is the one that really uh, is the, the shining one that's there, but it was, it, it was not on and of, in and of itself just alone. It was the product of so many different other sacrifices that were happening that led to this moment. People who were in the story, people who are not in the story. And so when we think about what our religion, Islam, says about sacrifice, but it says in particular with respect to Eid al-Adha, when we think about the nature of Eid al-Adha, we sometimes say the Bakra Eid or the Gobi, that, that the growths or like animals are being uh, sacrificed and whatnot. And Allah tells us very powerfully that as it relates to Ibrahim, as it relates to the animals that are sacrificed, that it's neither the meat or the blood that reaches Allah. Instead, it is your piety. It's your righteousness that reaches Allah. So it's not just about what you do in the tangible moment. What, what is that action that you sacrifice? It's what your intention is. What's your sincerity, that a level of sincerity? What is your purpose with respect to which you come to that space? That the Quran says, never shall you attain righteousness. Never shall you attain what is here until you give from what you love. Whoso, whatsoever you give, Allah is fully aware of it. So sacrifice requires us to do something a little bit difficult. It requires us to do something a little bit challenging. But it's not just something we can, uh, we can just put materially into like, look, I did all this. I, I, I sacrificed this one thing, and it doesn't matter to me. The Prophet ﷺ had related with respect to a poor man's donation that one silver coin is worth more than a thousand. And they said, how? Because that poor man only has two coins. And someone who's rich who just gave a pile, he's got a lot more. Thinking about that sacrifice is something that is dear to us. It's something that is, is very near to us, but it's something that is absolutely grounded in intention. Because at the end of the day, that particular sacrifice comes and goes. But it is our intention that lives on. It is our uh, the heart and our devotion at that moment that lives on. So we close today and shall think about what are the implications for us when we look at this story just from a slightly different lens, just by zooming out a little bit, that each of us sacrifices differently. Each of us shows up to our deen. Each of us shows up to our religion. Each of us shows up to our life, to our work, wherever we are, differently. We all sacrifice in different ways. When you look at this story, look at how different people sacrifice at different points. Yes, Ibrahim was about to sacrifice, but who else was sacrificing? Imagine a mother Hajar sitting on the side and she hears a scream and thinking, you just brought us to this valley. And now you want to go ahead and sacrifice. Uh, if you want to sacrifice Ismail. Of course, a woman of her faith, she she, you know, she she knew what that Allah's promise is. But just imagine, you know, having to go through all the things you've already gone through, the sacrifices you've already done, and to get to that point to where this is about to happen. So thinking about when we see sacrifices such as this, we begin to see the sacrifices of not just ourselves in a more expanded way, but of other people. We might think other people are not doing as much as us. 
They're not sacrificing as much as us. They're not doing um, the things that we're doing. But at the end of the day, these sacrifices are seen and done for only one entity, for Allah. And Allah is the one who judges for these sacrifices. It's not for us to particularly say. So Eid al-Adha commemorates Ibrahim's willingness and sacrifice to put a knife and to sacrifice that which is most beloved to, to get to that point. Fortunately, Allah said, no, that's not where, what we want of you. But it was a sacrifice, it was a hallmark of his commitment and his dedication up until this point. It was not of spilling of blood. If it was about the blood, if it was about, yes, take no other thing beloved before me, we would have a very different narrative. It wasn't about the blood. It wasn't about me. It was about the willingness to get to that point, to build up to that point where you are able to uh, be ready to sacrifice that or give up that which is most beloved to him. But it was part of a process. Ibrahim did not just wake up one day, 80 years old, and uh, given a son and said, all right, now do this. It was a lifelong journey to get to that point. And so when we look at ourselves here, think about at this moment, what are those things that we might be willing to sacrifice, that we have challenges in sacrificing? But those things that of the purpose of the sacrifice is that which reminds you of Allah, that which disconnects you actually from Allah, that which makes you forgetful of Allah, that when an offering is brought, when a sacrifice is made in those times and now, it's a devotion to Allah. It's recognizing that there is a God. It's recognizing a relationship to Allah. So think about that thing which we're willing to sacrifice that disconnects us, that makes us forgetful. What attachments will we put a knife to? Not a literal knife, a metaphorical knife. I'm not accounting for uh, inciting for any kind of violence or anything. What kind of metaphorical knife are we going to put with respect to whether it's our ego, whether it's the attachment we have to our wealth, whether it's the attachment we have to envy, hatred, or other things that disconnect us, or to ignorance, or any other vices, poor time management, anything like that? What is disconnecting us from Allah? What is disconnecting us from the people around? What is, what is holding us into that space and what is pulling us back? And so when we think about this and we close with this, inshallah, ask yourself, Ibrahim, after a lifetime of sacrifices, was still tested by Allah to that last moment um, and passed all of his tests, as the Quran says. But it was part of the process. So when we think about ourselves, reflect that what are the things that we are willing to sacrifice, but just knowing that sacrifice is a part and parcel of our faith. When we see in the Quran narrative of Ibrahim and Ismail to that point of sacrifice, Allah says, Aslama. They submitted. It's the same root as Islam, same exact trilateral root, Salama, as Islam. That they submitted and then they were about to engage in the sacrifice. It was a consensual thing. They're about to engage in the sacrifice and we stopped it. That it was, it was stopped at that moment. And for us at this moment, thinking about is that what is, what is uh, when we say we're Muslim, those who submit, when we say we are followers of the religion of Islam, that we submit, what does it mean for us, inshallah? And that knowing that sacrifice is part of our walk as well, but knowing that we're not the only ones who are sacrificing. Other people are sacrificing. Other people have sacrificed for us to get here. Other people will sacrifice for us to get to where we may need to go and think about how we can be more aware of this. Just like in this story, inshallah, when we think about Ibrahim, we think about the other people as well, and he himself in this journey. So, inshallah, I mean, let's think about and reflect as we close that we ask Allah to make us of those people whom not just understand, not just uh, think about and think that we've got this element of sacrifice, but that we ponder and we reflect upon the true meaning of what sacrifice means. That when Allah says, in the Quran, that do people think they'll be left alone once they have, uh, they, that they believed that they'll be left alone? No, that they'll be continue to be tested, they'll continue to be challenged. But it's not an isolated experience in that way. You experience that test, but by the grace of Allah, if we look at the story, we see that there are other elements at work as well. There are other people that are sacrificing. There are other things that are being sacrificed. So let's make, let's make a dua that Allah enables us to not just be people who sacrifice, but to understand who all else is sacrificing. But that may Allah also accept of us, of all the sacrifices that we've made up until this point, especially on this eighth, no matter how big or how small, and make them a means of reconnection with Allah. If anything else, make them a reconnection with Allah in this life and the next. And may Allah enable us to continue to walk in the footsteps of Hajj, 
continue to walk in the footsteps of Ismail in the footsteps of Ibrahim in recognizing when we can defer to Allah and uh, to submit to Allah, uh, even when it may be the most uncomfortable at that moment. And that may Allah allow us to leave this Eid al-Adha, leave this Eid al-Adha better than we came into it, and allow us to leave any place that we do better than we had entered it. And may Allah make us a people, a muttaqeen, a people of taqwa, a people of God consciousness, because these muttaqeen are those, as the pious predecessors before us, who made those sacrifices, who made those efforts and striving in the way of Allah, but not inhumanely, not in a way that was absent. They made it in a way with their full human experience. And so we ask Allah to uh, enable us to do this. And may, as our father Ibrahim prayed, as our father Ibrahim had prayed, after the story of the sacrifice, he went with his son later on in their life. They put together, they put the bricks together of the Kaaba. They built the Kaaba together. This was Ibrahim and Ismail's purpose. It was not just that sacrifice. This is where they laid the foundations. And as Ibrahim prayed at that time with his son upon completing the Kaaba, we pray as well. Our Lord, thou art that accept this from us. Now accept this service from us. You brought us, imagine, a lifelong journey up until this point, migration, sacrifice, tears, knives, all these different things up until this point, adversity. We've created and built this house. For you. We've built this house for you and accept this humble service from us. Thou art all hearing and all knowing of which we do. So ask ourselves, whatever we're sacrificing for, what is our Kaaba at the end of the line? What, is, what are we building at the end of the line? Ibrahim and his son built that Kaaba. His sacrifice built that ultimate house of worship for Allah. What are we building for our legacy when we leave here, inshallah? Ameen. Allahumma ameen. Again, Eid Mubarak to you all. Assalamu alaikum wa barakatuh. I don't know if we have uh, any particular announcements, uh, child, but uh, I know there's donuts in the back. So please feel free to help yourselves. Uh, again, as uh, as you are comfortable, uh, do uh, we've got some, some other stuff as well, coffee, but please be the lot uh, engage in, in the celebration of the same. <laughs>